pričati na engleski, uh, o engleskom, uh, učim vaš jezik, ali I'm old and it's really difficult. <laughs> um, so, thank you all for having me today and thank you guys for sticking around after the coffee break. I know it's lunchtime. Um, is everyone okay if I speak English? Does anyone need translation? Don't be shy if you do. No? Okay. okay, great. So, I'm Samantha. I'm from the Post-Conflict Research Center uh, in Sarajevo. I have been there for about a year and a half. As you can tell, I'm not from here. Um, I'm from Chicago, and I've been working in art and arts and human rights advocacy for about six years now. Um, so, I came here to work for the Post-Conflict Research Center. Um, which is dedicated to restoring a culture of peace and preventing violent conflict in the Western Balkans by creating, implementing, and supporting unconventional and innovative approaches to peace education, post-conflict research, human rights, and transitional justice. So what does that mean in everyday speak? Um, it means that we look to fill in the gaps left by uh, formal mechanisms so while a lot of approaches toward a strong democracy, toward um, inter-ethnic cooperation, toward transitional justice are done from up top and the idea, the idea is that for, for them to trickle down, we are focused on changing attitudes. Um, in English we say changing hearts and minds um, because that's an essential part of the process because if people you can have all the right legal mechanisms in place, um, but if people's minds don't change, what's the point? I think. Sorry, my English. <laughs> um, uh, so we strive for a society where people no longer perceive diversity as a source of conflict, but as the basis for prosperity. We are committed to establishing an environment where human rights are respected and the principles of transparency, accountability, and the rule of law are upheld to support a healthy democracy. Once again, uh, the idea is just to create projects um, that show people the value of diversity and show people the value of interethnic cooperation and religious cooperation, um, of positive behavior, pro-social behavior. Um, so our, we've produced 10 documentaries and seven photo exhibitions. This is a little bit of our impact. I won't read you all the numbers. You guys can see it yourselves. But um, our reach has been pretty impressive, especially um, we're, we're a small staff, so we're all working all the time. But we're really proud of how many people we've reached. Um, so how do we do this? How do we change people's minds? How do we build positive attitudes? How do we encourage positive behavior? Uh, first is through creative multimedia and the arts and that is the photo exhibitions and the films I told you about. We have a series, am I talking too fast? No, no. okay, <laughs> someone said yes, I'll try to slow down. Um, we talk very fast in Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. So creative multimedia and the arts is uh, those photo exhibitions and documentaries I told you about. Um, they are all themed around different aspects of um, post-conflict life, uh, whether that is trying to rebuild communities that are divided or um, remembering stories of the war or telling stories of people like uh, Bosnia's Roma population who are pushed to the margins. So um, I'd say our most well-known series is called Ordinary Heroes. Ordinary Heroes is uh, stories of inner ethnic rescue during the Bosnian War. 
and well, I'll show you a clip of one of those after I'm done speaking. Um, we then use those uh, in our Ordinary Heroes Peace Building pro Program, which goes into peace education. Um, <clears throat> the Ordinary Heroes Peace Building Program engages young people across Bosnia and Herzegovina. We really focus on rural areas that are otherwise underserved by, you know, cultural programming um, that don't necessarily have access to the same opportunities that youth and urban centers do. And what we do is we screen the documentary series and then um, there's an associated curriculum based on the idea of rescuer behavior. So what can you do to be a positive agent of change? And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, risking your life to save someone else during the war. It can also mean speaking out against an injustice, um, you know, challenging someone who says something hateful. Uh, it, it's a spectrum and it's just encouraging young people to <coughs> exhibit that quote unquote rescuer behavior. We also, um, our programs translate into preventing genocide, mass atrocity, and violent extremism. We use our programs to do civil society trainings to recognize signs of growing tensions. And we have a reporting system that we do with the UN. Um, if, say, hate crimes are increasing or hate speech is increasing, um, it's sort of like a telephone bank. I don't, you're probably too young for that. Um, it's people have a whole notification system to um, make sure that everyone is aware of the situation across the country. Post-conflict research, we do, we're the post-conflict research center, so obviously we do post-conflict research. Um, this includes everything from getting survivor testimonials to, um, you know, working on historical memory projects to one big thing we're committed to is coming up with best practices for how to evaluate arts-based and multimedia-based projects in the realm of peace building because you, you have to know if your projects are effective, if you want to make them better. Um, we don't just want to put something out into the world and say, well, I hope that works. Um, so we're really on the cutting edge of figuring out impact indicators, figuring out um, what resonates, what doesn't resonate, um, and finally, human rights and transitional justice. This, this is sort of a, co a combination of many of our other pillars. Um, it, we use multimedia, we use, um, we use peace education to really forward um, transitional justice in the country. Uh, we work with the ICTY Outreach Office, um, and we we work with a number of victims associations from all groups, and so those that's our main strategy. It's it it can be difficult to explain in a short time because there's so many different aspects. But basically, you can think of the thread that connects everything is that we're complementing formal me mechanisms with our work. Here's some shots of some of our films, um, Ordinary Heroes. That's uh, Hamdia and his son. He was sheltered by a Bosnian Croat woman uh, from HVO forces through the entirety of the war. Um, he's Bosniak Muslim. Uspomene 677, which contrasts um, stories of young people born after the war to those who lived during the war, unprotected about the process of um, witness protection or lack of witness protection and women war and peace um, I came to testify which screened on PBS and is about uh, women who uh, testified against perpetrators of sexual violence and what it took to be able to do that so this brings me to on the margins which is primarily why I'm here today on the Margins is the exhibition about uh, Bosnia's Roma population. So the background of it is we were filming a documentary, which is still in the works, about um, human trafficking or among Roma women. But while in these Roma communities, we gathered that we had to tell the story of the root problem that kept um, Roma 
on the margins of society, um, which led to, which leads to poor poor health outcomes, poor socioeconomic health outcomes, um, lack of safety, um, increased exploitation. So together with the OSCE, we are producing, or we have produced. It is it will premiere in May. Um, this exhibition, which pairs common stereotypes about the Roma with uh, photos and stories and um, didactic text about to challenge those stereotypes. So um, in making this, we were very involved with the local communities. Um, the Roma communities that we worked in informed a lot of what we did. Uh, we had Roma fixers who um, informed us of the stories they thought needed to be told. They um, were they worked with us to make sure that we didn't paint an unrealistic picture of Roma life. We wanted to convey the widespread discrimination faced, but victories um, in the face of that discrimination. So um, our our primary challenge was to share inspiring stories and show counter narratives to a lot of these common stereotypes but without saying like hey hey look everything's great um no work to be done here <clears throat> so um this like i said will premiere in may in sarajevo it will then show again during warm festival in sarajevo in june july which is the war art reporting and memory festival um after that we are looking to tour toured around um, different municipalities in Bosnia with the OSC, um, primarily in places with large Roma populations and OSCE field offices. That is the plan. Um, so I'm just going to share a couple of the stories with you right now. So um, this woman is, she, I love this picture, first of all. Um, she looks so cool. Um, she, this woman is 27-year-old uh, Dragana, and she is a Roma woman who was left in the hospital uh, by her parents because she had a, a condition that made the doctors fear she would never walk again. She was subsequently adopted, um, went to... Um, went to the faculty of sports and um, converted to Islam and now is married with two kids and teaches Taekwondo and has won a silver and a bronze medal in Taekwondo. Um, this directly challenges the stereotype that Roma women are either portrayed as calculated seductresses or helpless child brides who are exploited by their husbands and families at large. Um, and in the exhibition, we'll also give some background as to how this stereotype came about. Um, it was, it's rooted in the Roma's 500 years in slavery when um, they were, when Roma women were either used to produce more slave labor or used to entertain the, the masters of, um, of the estates. So it's giving people context as to where it came from, really pinpointing maybe what their own stereotypes are, and then offering a counterexample. <clears throat> this is Asim. He's 56. Um, he is a carpenter, and he also makes carpentry tools. He is um, the sole carpenter and tool maker in his area. He is passing this trade to his, his two sons. Um, he has a busy family business um, and is expanding, I believe. Um, I'm not sure if he has any employees other than his sons, but it's a very successful business. And everyone in the area, Croats, Serbs, Roma, uh, Bosniaks, rely on him for tools and for woodworking. And this is to challenge a stereotype that um, 
many Roma practice traditional crafts within their insular communities um, as a symptom of their unwillingness to integrate into mainstream society. Um, the background of this stereotype is that craftsmanship has been a time-honored tradition within the Roma community um, and have often been the go-to people for things like blacksmithing, woodworking. Um, this has taken on a negative connotation, but in reality, craftsmanship continues to be um, a, a cultural practice that also translates into um, a lucrative economic practice and is a way to um, engage in mainstream society. So that's all I'm going to talk at you today. Um, if you are interested in Peace Darcy, you can visit our website. We also <laughs> run an online media outlet called Balkan Discourse, um, which is contributed to by activists, academics, and we have youth correspondents from all over the country. Uh, we're always looking for interns and youth correspondents. I don't know if that's interesting to any of you, but I thought I would throw that out there anyway. Uh, now I am going to show you a clip called Crossing Bridges, One Man's Story of Heroism. It is from our Ordinary Hero series. Uh, it's, I won't explain it too much, it'll become obvious once it's on the screen. Um, this was screened on UN TV and Ordinary Heroes has been seen between Al Jazeera Balkans and UN TV, I believe, by 300 million people. So, without further delay. Okay, this is the difference between Bosnian audiences and uh, Chicago audiences. You can't get a word in edgewise in Chicago. Um, so that was our story of Zoran. Um, we have uh, an episode of um, a man who rescued two, a Serb man who rescued two of his uh, Bosniak neighbors from um, a camp. We have the story of Yagoda. Um, we have this and a story of a rescue in Sarajevo. Um, so, like I said, we use these stories to, um, you know, show young people what rescue behavior is. We explore what makes these people different from people who, you know, didn't rescue or people who were passive bystanders and um, that, again, has proven to be a very successful program. So, any questions? Yes. Hello, everyone. I will speak in English because my question is addressed to Samantha. Thank you. First of all, uh, I would like to say uh, thank you to Samantha because uh, we are really glad that we have you here. Uh, we believe that this is an important topic and uh, we, are, we are happy that uh, we, we get some insight from, from the, uh, let's say, work of, your, of the Post-Conflict Research Center. Uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned uh, the relation between discrimination and stereotypes. Mm. Uh, my question is, uh, because here in Balkans, uh, mm. there's a strong and close uh, connection between discrimination and stereotypes. And often discrimination isn't uh, detected or people don't see discrimination mm -hmm. as a discrimi discrimination because it fits in the common stereotypes here in Balkans. Mm -hmm. My question is, uh, what is the situation in the United States of America? Because mm -hmm. uh, we have perception from here, from mm -hmm. this part of the world, that uh, there's a, a certain conflict between uh, black people and uh, white people in the uh, United States of America, especially mm -hmm. in the southern, southern parts. Mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, how how the the U.S. Uh, society deals with that uh, with, the, with that stereotypes? Because uh, when you when you see black people, uh, their future is often uh, there's a perce perception of their future that they are likely to turn uh, to crime or something mm -hmm. like that. So, uh, how the U.S. society deals with, with the discrimination and stereotypes uh, in that way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so. Like I said, I am from Chicago, which is the most segregated city in the country. Not a lot of people know that, but um, the way the city was designed in the 70s was to keep um, 
black people and white people separate, specifically black people living in poverty. Um, they built highways to keep people segregated. They built uh, different public parks to keep people separated. It was a very intentional thing. So actually, um, thanks for the question, because one of the reasons I came to the Balkans was to um, learn about division in a different context, because Chicago is so divided. Um, and I'll preface what I'm saying by also um, acknowledging that I am a relatively privileged white woman, so everything um, I've experienced is um, through that lens and I can speak about what I see, but um, I don't have the personal experience of being discriminated against. So um, I just think it's always important to note that. Um, so in the US, there is long-standing um, negative stereotypes and discrimination against the African-American community. Uh, these obviously were rooted in um, slavery, much like the Roma, if you actually look at uh, the history of the Roma and the history of African Americans, they're fairly similar of uh, a long period in uh, slavery and then disenfranchisement um, and discrimination by mainstream communities. So a lot of the discrimination and negative stereotypes took, I would say, took root in um, assuaging people's guilt about owning slaves. So if you can convince yourself and other people that the people they're owning are less than human, maybe it's not so bad. Um, so there was an inherent um, motivation for coming up with negative stereotypes against African Americans. These have carried on um, uh, specifically as politicians have feared organizing the organizing power of African American communities. Um, pushing them to the margins, um, and also making, uh, reinforcing negative stereotypes among African Americans themselves to undermine any sort of self-belief, um, undermine any efforts to organize um, by, by crippling belief in themselves and in their own communities. Um, you can see this a lot today. A lot of people say that there's um, that race is all of the sudden a problem, um, but I this is just my opinion. I'm just these are just my opinions, by the way. These are not PCRC's opinions. Um, I would say that um, a lot of this has been bubbling under the surface and wasn't addressed during the civil rights movement, which was again for civil rights, not for full social anti-discrimination, not for, um, so it achieved what it set out to, but a lot of these underlying attitudinal problems remained. So I say what we're seeing now is, you can look, you can look at the U.S. as a post-conflict society, 150 years after the Civil War, that never really reconciled and never really dealt with some of the divisive and harmful narratives. And actually, I worked on a project about Trans, about the U.S. as a post-conflict society versus Bosnia as a post-conflict society versus Colombia as a post-conflict society versus Congo as a post-conflict society. And what we saw was that um, a lot of the same themes ran throughout each country. So that was, you know, the um, othering of different groups, um, unequal access to resources, unequal access to education. Um, so the U.S. is not immune from, I'd say, post-conflict issues. Even, even 150 years later, I'd say that's the root of what we're dealing with. I know that was a long-winded answer, but it's a, <laughs> it's a complicated question. Anyone else? The first time you came to Bosnia? The first time I came to Bosnia um, was when I moved here. I mean, how many years ago? A year and a half ago. Uh, did you guys have any kind of progress? You know, in, the meantime? in the meantime? 
I'll say that there's no progress in the U.S. right now either, in my mind. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, on a micro level, I've seen people's, I've seen young people that we've worked with um, change opinions and become more open-minded. So like on those micro levels, it's really encouraging. But um, overall, I would say that's, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm happy to answer whatever.